When I came to you there on that cold telephone call, horror of the night. And you came out to meet me and then tell me things and sit down on the porch way. Congratulations, you come home next month. Humble as a monk, we celebrate with Chris Down the skunk. The family's large, it's hard being guard. Still take charge, come home to a massage. I lined up credit cards, a philanthropy who's a park in the garage. I'm trying to make up for the times when you was gone. Being locked up when my heart was torn. You wrote me letters, telling me when you come home, things would be much better. I melt your peer tins for who wear sweater. Up in the P now, dip for the weather. Through difficult times, it's hard to maintain. I strive to live in a shelter that blocks out the rain. And that rain is pain. The stress on the brain will have a nigga. Forced to stay awake, late nights is hard to sleep One eye peak, cause the kids you chalked up may be trying to keep on me Mental explosion, when I meditate over by Tapper Lake Thoughts she made calm like the ocean, buffalo to war potion Everything seems like slow motion, then I stare at the stars Surrounded by trees, sometimes I feel like a fallen leaf Blown away by wind, reality, strong breeze But you're free, I took the block off the horn To let knowledge be born, blood brothers forever Kill the bees on the swarm Guns blast, I recollect on the past of how we ran wild together, chasing cash and that. More time thing, men it just stinks. For nugget rings, went back far like acorn fights and riding swings. King pinch down, juveniles raised with major flakes. Tenth grade came, went on our own in separate ways. Never realized poppy would die. I leave my side when you pass, get a chronic till my insides dry. Homicide never, I visualize better. You live forever in my heart, son. Mentally done, we roll together though years past. I still hear blasts and guns flash. My nigga run fast, was coming to a life this crash. On the concrete, my legs felt weak. I couldn't eat, yet alone sleep. The shit is way beyond bone deep. Now I sit beers, shed a few tears with our peers. Play the rears, do the knowledge to clears and cold stairs. Yo, it's hard, kid. I swear to my unborn. This war's going on. Veterans taking falls to young corns, but I stay strong. Try to move on and live life to the fullest. Rest in peace to the girl who took the bullet. norms and social progress of our society as a whole. The American battle cry, make the world safe for democracy, has had little meaning for black Americans. The black soldier has fought and shed his blood for a freedom which he has not been permitted fully to share. He has faced blatant racism, humiliation, and physical abuse. However, as volunteers, the discrimination that confronted the black servicewoman was even more galling than the hardships and frustrations encountered by their brothers in arms. Black women in the military had to deal with the segregation generated not only by their race, but also by their sex. Like their brothers, black service women have struggled to prove their worth by seeking to share with whites the patriotic responsibilities of being an American. During World War II, as I said, all the black units were segregated. Uh, there, on some places, some posts, there were two black detachments. There would be a white and a black. Uh, they did not uh, participate in any type of sport together. They did not socialize or anything like that. And they usually worked in separate. Like if there was a hospital, there was usually two hospitals on the post. The blacks would work at one and the whites would work at the other. Uh, then as, you, as we moved on after World War II, uh, I'd say about, well, up until about 1950, yeah, 1950, the army was still segregated. 
And then in 1950, I think it was October 1950, they integrated the service. And then things started to gel a little bit. But there was always a problem. We still had to prove ourselves. And even though you proved yourself, that the promotions were slow. Uh, we didn't have as many Negro officers. Uh, they still kept to the wartime quota, which was 7%. I think they even dropped it down to 7% at one time. But uh, now things are, well, before they disestablished the Women's Army Corps in 76, 77, I think. The uh, women were moving up, the black men were moving up. We had several, we still have several command sergeant majors, uh, sergeant majors, first sergeants and whatnot. Uh, the women are able to go into more fields within the service than we were allowed during World War II. Women have a long history of service in the military. The first American woman reported to have served in the armed forces was Deborah Sampson Garrett during the Revolutionary War. She also has the distinction of being the first black woman to serve disguised as a man in the 4th Massachusetts Regiment. She was commended for an, quote, extraordinary instance of female heroism, end quote. A black woman is also heralded for preventing George Washington from being assassinated during the American Revolution. Sojourner Truth was a heroine of the Civil War. She courageously cared for wounded soldiers and helped further the cause against slavery. Black women have contributed proportionately to the prosperity of the nation. In peace and war, they have shared in the effort to advance civilization and preserve the fundamental principles of democracy. When America entered World War II, the idea was conceived that women could fill non-combat positions in the Army, thereby releasing men for combat duty. Thus, the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps was born. When the Corps was established in 1942, many women clustered at the recruiting doors to be among the first to join. Black women were no different. They clamored to contribute their part to the war effort. During our uh, military service um, here in the United States, uh, some of the uh, women in the Army Corps were given jobs which were um, what they should have been doing, such as if they were secretaries, they had secretarial jobs. But a great many of them, no matter what job they had, were put into, like cooks and bakers. Uh, some of the girls were in the motor pool and they drove um, jeeps and trucks and things of that sort. Uh, <clears throat> while we were in the United States, in some of the uh, army camps where we were um, stationed, the black women were given the more or less menial jobs to do, not um, jobs which they had been trained to do. In July 1942, 39 black women out of a pool of 440 women were on active duty. In September 1943, the quote, auxiliary, was dropped from the name and women became a true part of the United States Army, the Women's Army Corps. By the summer of 1945, the Corps had 120 black officers and nearly 4,000 black enlisted women on duty. However, the Women's Army Corps paralleled the Army in its treatment of blacks. The black wax soon joined in with other blacks in the service demanding equity in job assignments and training. Black service women complained that while they were relegated to positions of cooks, bakers, and floor sweepers, white women were assigned to field jobs and higher technical schools. These inequities prompted 100 black wax in March 1945 to stage a sit-in. Black wax were also refused overseas duty. Not one black unit had been requisitioned to serve overseas until 1945. All the whites in the Women's Army Corps were serving in all theaters of operation. The European theater was the only overseas theater to employ black wax. Prompted by a furor of protests from civil rights activists and the black community, the 6th Eight Central Postal Directory Battalion made military history and became the only black whack unit assigned to overseas duty. Novella Alls was one of the women who stepped foot on English shores in February 1945. At first, they did not want black wax. 
Uh, in the beginning, uh, when they first established the Women's Army Corps, they said that we would be authorized overseas duty also, but it would have to be at the discretion of the overseas commander. And at that time, it was General Eisenhower, and he did not want Negro whites in the theater. But the Negro press and the uh, NAACP and several other civil rights groups, they finally forced uh, the government to send us over, and General Eisenhower had to accept us. Why didn't General Eisenhower want black wax in the European theater? I imagine there were several reasons. Uh, the Army was just was an extension, really, of the United States, and at that time, the United States was segregated. Of course, all our units were segregated, but I imagine that was one of the main reasons. They didn't want us over there. Uh, they didn't want, they wanted the black women to, the way some of them put it, the way the general put it in the statement I have, that uh, they wanted us near the black men to more or less be their companions. And of course, again, the press and whatnot said, no, this would not be allowed. But that's the only reason I can think of. It's just an extension, I think, of the times in the United States. Very little is mentioned about the more than 800 black women who volunteered for duty abroad while the war was still raging in Europe. Little is known of the postal unit's fine record of efficiency in dispatching the mail at a time when troops were constantly on the move. It seemed like an impossible task. Before the arrival of the 6th Eighth, the Central Directory was operated by enlisted men and civilians. They were swamped by mail with an undelivered backlog of three million pieces. The battalion's job was to keep up with the current addresses of the fighting men. The unit broke all records for redirecting mail. They worked day and night in eight-hour shifts, averaging more than 65,000 pieces of mail. They won the praises and admiration of the Army brass and were considered one of the best units in the Women's Army. Major Triello Welch said the unit performed, quote, one of the greatest jobs of the war. But similar to their fighting brothers, the unit's triumph was overshadowed by charges questioning their effectiveness. The 6888 was the only overseas unit that did not receive a citation. Novella Alls wants to fill in the missing pages in the history books about the contributions of black service women. Why are you writing a book on black women in the military and your experiences in the 6888? Well, I feel that the women who, worked, uh, who served in the Army during uh, World War II, uh, those that have served after World War II in time of peace, and again in war, Korea, and Vietnam, and those that are still in the service, uh, are a living part of history, an integral part of history, American and white history, and black history. And I feel like the book should be published. Do you feel that what your unit did made a difference? I think it really did. I think it opened the eyes of a lot of people. Uh, several of the officers that were over there for inspection, white officers were there, on inspection, they have repeatedly said we were the best unit overseas. We did not, we did not receive any recognition for it, but we were the best unit. As a result of our investigation into the history of the 6888, the fact that it did not receive a unit citation is being investigated by the Department of Army. The 6888 might be remembered finally in the Army's official records. Why don't you join the Army? Well, at the time, I was in school in Alabama State, and the Army was gathering all the fellas up. I was, big, I was rallied, really kind of disillusioned with Alabama State at the time for several reasons. And I figured this was an opportunity to try something different, to get away from maybe there would be an outlet somewhere that would break a mold of the teacher, doctor type thing. You know, I wanted to be a teacher. I figured maybe this might be an out. So I joined. It wasn't really patriotism at the time. After you were in there, after I was in there, of course, then it became patriotism. What kind of woman became a part of this unit? Why did you want to serve? Well, there were uh, various reasons. Some uh, women uh, wanted to uh, be in to actually be a part of the um, war effort. Um, my husband was... Um, and this had, had been uh, drafted into the Navy. I was married at the time, and I didn't want to stay home 
So I wanted to go in and do whatever bit I could, so I enlisted into the Women's Army Corps. Mary Rozier entered the Women's Army Corps in 1943. She was instrumental in forging the first reunion of the 6888 to commemorate and celebrate the unit's service to America. We all received our Army um, overseas training in Fort Oglethorpe, Georgia. We went through the regular um, overseas training with our uh, gas masks in the gas chambers. We climbed the cargo net and the, took the five mile hike and just went through the regular routine that the regular soldiers went in, except um, we didn't actually uh, have pistols or the regular guns. We did not know where we were going, but then when we did leave, the next morning we were out at sea, and we were not told that we did not have a naval escort, any type of escort for this ship, because the Old France was considered one of the fastest ships on the seas at that time, so they didn't figure we needed an escort, but I think it was about the sixth or seventh, I can't remember exactly what night, that we were out, the German sub chased us. And of course that meant the ship rocked and rolled all night long and the women fell out of their bunks and all kinds of little mishaps. No one was seriously hurt amongst our women. Uh, I was lucky enough to be up on deck the next morning, however, with you know, courtesy of one of the MPs, and uh, I saw a GI who had died a fight the night before buried at sea. That was quite an experience. Uh, the ship, you, you were just there. You had to stand in line for hours to go to the mess hall. And to get back up there, there was always a line. You weren't allowed up on deck except for a uh, boat drill. Uh, a lot of the women got sick. Some had sick and stayed sick until they got off the boat. But we managed and we survived. But then going up the English Channel, again, I had the opportunity to be up on deck. And I saw the Ile de France maneuver its way through the minefield across the channel, which was very frightening. Adjusting to the rigors and restrictions of army life was not easy. Black women had to not only deal with the strict discipline and rigorous regimentation of the military, but also with a system not fully equipped to meet their personal needs. Out of necessity, black wacks were the first to sport the Afro hairstyle, which did not become the trend until the late 60s with the advent of black pride. The relationship between the black service women and the black GIs overseas also suffered because of the pressures under which both had to function. This dissension was most apparent when black women were seen in the company of white men. Often the women were stigmatized as promiscuous and subjected to verbal abuse from some black soldiers. Generally, however, most black men and women serving overseas were able to adjust to the mental pressures and discomforts of a system that did not welcome them with open arms. What was America like during that period? During that period, there was um, quite a bit of racial prejudice uh, here in the United States. And although um, we had become accustomed to it, although we were still fighting against it. And um, in the military service, it was even more so because in, uh, some, in most of the army uh, groups where we were sent, uh, our uh, units were segregated in one area of the post and the white uh, military service people would be on the other side. At his inauguration in 1933, President Roosevelt exhorted a depression-frightened nation that, quote, there is nothing to fear but fear itself. It would take the start of the war itself following the surprise attack by the Japanese on Pearl Harbor, December 7, 1941, and the gearing up of America's immense war productions machinery to start the country on the road to unprecedented prosperity. In the meantime, black people in America were hardest hit by the depression. While one in 10 white men was without work, only one in 10 black men held a job. The long, long bread lines were disproportionately black, not gray. So in 1940, the US, knowing ultimately it would have to join the fight against Hitler and company, 
enticed young men into the military by promising educational benefits for a year served in uniform. Jobless black youths joined whites in swarming into the armed services, and ultimately, more than one million blacks would serve in America's greatest war, which at its peak in 1944 had more than eight million men under arms. Of these, 8.6% were black. As America entered a Second World War, segregation was still the rule in the military and in civilian life. Black servicemen and women, both at home and overseas, felt the sting of racial bigotry. What was America like then? I know you said it was segregated, but specifically, what was it like for a black person? Well, in the, in the 40s, and I stayed, I was at Alabama State at the time, and that being the South, it was really segregated. That was still the time of riding the back of the bus, segregated uh, trains, uh, separate water fountains, separate restaurants, you were not allowed to eat in a restaurant, separate theaters, separate everything. That was in the South. Now, I'm from Cincinnati, Ohio, uh, the North. But at that time, although I went to an integrated school, there were still separate schools, some separate schools. The theaters were segregated. The restaurants were segregated. We did not have this business of riding the back of the bus or the separate water fountains or things like that that they had in the South. Uh, the South was open with theirs, open with their segregation. The North was more subtle, but it was there. How did you feel wanting to serve your country and your country, in essence, not wanting you to serve it? Well, I don't think it was uh, the country, really, uh, that did not want us to serve as black women. I think it was the Army itself, the commanders in the Army, the high-ranking officers. Uh, if you look back to history, you'll realize that most of your officers, male officers, are from the South. Therefore, they did not want not only black women, they really did not want black men. And then, of course, with the war coming along, World War II, they had to have help. There was only a resource. The blacks had to go in. Although they didn't want us, they had to have us. Did you notice any difference between the way white Americans treated you and the way Europeans treated you? Yes, there was a decided difference. Uh, we were uh, very cordially greeted. Uh, in fact, when we first arrived in Birmingham, England, it was an evening, and there were crowds of people there. Most of them had never seen black wax or black women probably before. And uh, they were there to uh, cheerfully greet us. And then um, uh, they extended invitation to a number of the girls to come and uh, have dinner, lunch, and even spend the weekend in their homes. And we were very um, warmly um, received by them. And um, after we uh, went to Paris, or Rouen and Paris, uh, the same um, attempt was made to make us feel welcome. I can remember one incident, which was rather unpleasant, and it involved the uh, really only unpleasant incident that I received, and that was by an American soldier. I was walking down the street in Paris, and uh, this American soldier was coming down the street with a French girl, and just before um, they reached us, he said, uh, he told her to say, hi, nigger, and when they reached us, she said it. So um, the bad treatment was all on the part of the American soldiers, not on the native Europeans. The English reaction to the black women of the 6888 are characterized in a Birmingham, England newspaper dated March 1945. A surprising fact concerning most of the vast majority of these wax is that the nasal intonation characteristic of the speech of the vast majority of Americans is comparatively faint. They speak extremely good English, much better English than the average native. They have lively minds and an interest in historical England which is insatiable. They seem to know a great deal more about the Shakespeare country than most Midlanders. In fact, these wax are very different from the colored women portrayed on the films where they are usually either domestics of the outspoken old retainer type or slow-eyed sirens given to gaudiness of costume and eccentricity in dress. The wax have dignity and proper reserve. Um, we arrived in England, in Birmingham, England, in 1945, and um, 
February, and we were there for about three and a half months. After um, that period of time, we moved to Rouen, France, which is where Joan of Arc was burned at the stake. We stayed there for about four months, and from there we went to Paris, France, and we were there until um, March of 1946 when the group, the last group of girls returned home. Some were discharged. Others decided to make the Women's Army Corps a career. Novella Alls was one of those women. Following her duties with the 6888, she was honorably discharged in November 1945 at her request. But in 1950, Alls decided to re-enlist in the WAX. She was a part of the Corps for another 17 years until her retirement as a staff sergeant in 1967. You feel that the performance of your unit is a missing page in history that is finally being discovered. Yes, I do. Absolutely. There, we were, the, as I said in the beginning, we were the only black unit to serve in any theater of operations during war, during World War II. And the women, the white women in the service, they have been put into books, magazines, and whatnot, all kinds of publications. We have not. We are missing. And I think we belong there. Where do you think the black woman belongs in the military history of the United States? I feel um, that they belong, they have their own niche in, in that they want to do something for their country even though they weren't always welcome or weren't always encouraged to do this. And um, this took a lot of spunk to want to try to get in somewhere where you weren't always wanted. And um, a lot of them used initiative, they were able, they were able to add something that would otherwise have been left out in the history of the United States. We are a part of history. And if you go back through history, you'll find that the Negro, the black, whatever you want to call it, has been omitted from history. Right now, they're coming out with some things in the newspaper and magazines and all kinds of publications, letting the people know that the man that you thought was white was not white. He was black. And these are the things that we need to know. It's a part of American history, and it should be in American history, not omitted. Like they say, we too serve during the war. It's just like they forget the 92nd. They forget the 93rd. They forget all those black units. Black Americans have tried to live up to the credo that in time of war, it is the privilege of all American citizens, regardless of race or sex, to serve in the United States Armed Forces. However, they have continually been confronted with roadblocks and hardships. Black men and women have dedicated parts of their lives and in some instances have given their lives to help keep this country free and help others regain or maintain their freedom. Although America has traditionally recognized and honored those who have answered the patriotic call to arms, that tradition has not been historically extended to blacks. Since the armed forces have become more unisex, women in the army are not called wax anymore. But the women of the 6888 were proud of that name. Their outstanding gallantry and meritorious record exemplify the heroic tradition of the United States Army. Because they have served their country with courage, dignity, and honor, the women of the 6888 should not remain unremembered faces of World War II, nor should their contributions remain an enigma in American history. Someone wrote that, quote, color has no place in war, merit is the only measure of a man, end quote. That also applies to the women of the 6888. <laughs> For a transcript, send $2 to Tony Brown Productions, 1501 Broadway, Suite 2014, New York, New York, 10036. Please include program topic and allow three weeks for delivery. Tony Brown.